And now we're moving down the iceberg into tier 3, with our first entry on tier 3 being Vader Attacks TV Host. Vader as a wrestler was most known for his time in Japan and WCW, where he had won the WCW World Heavyweight title three times and the IWGP Heavyweight Championship three times. However, while he was working for the then WWF, he got into some legal trouble in Kuwait. In what was supposed to be a kayfabe moment, the Kuwaiti host of the program asked Vader if wrestling was fake. Vader flipped the table, grabbed the host by his tie and jerked him around while cursing at him and asking him if wrestling was fake. Vader believed it was supposed to be a work and was doing as he was instructed to do by Jerry Briscoe. Apparently, the host wasn't in on the act and Vader ended up being arrested and convicted of assault. Fortunately, he was let off with a $166 fine. And up next we have Sammy Guevara and Sasha Banks incident. Sammy Guevara is one of AEW's brightest young prospects, but he got himself in trouble during the speaking out movement in 2020 when a clip resurfaced and went viral of Sammy Guevara saying that he wanted to grape Sasha Banks when he was backstage at WWE. This was a shocking audio clip and fans were outraged. AEW subsequently suspended Guevara without pay, with him agreeing to go to extensive sensitivity training. It was also announced that Guevara's salary would be donated to the Women's Charity Center of Jacksonville, Florida. Sasha Banks later stated that she and Guevara had been in contact with each other and that he had apologized to her and that they had engaged in an open discussion to help him understand the severity of his comments. He completed his training and returned eventually. And up next we have The Undertaker crucify Steve Austin. Two of the Attitude Era's biggest stars, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Undertaker, would be the center of a controversy hailstorm on December 7, 1998. After the tag team match, The Undertaker attacked and knocked out Austin, allowing his druids to carry and tie him to The Undertaker's symbol on top of the stage. Despite being careful not to mention anything about crucifixion on television, several Christian groups were still up in arms at WWE claiming that what they did was very offensive to their religious beliefs. And up next we have Heroes of Wrestling. The pay-per-view event, Heroes of Wrestling, took place in 1999 and featured wrestlers from the 1980s. It was meant to capitalize on the popularity of professional wrestling at the time. However, it would suffer numerous controversies and poor buy rates. One of the many controversies was that they had to replace their previous color commentator, a well-known and respected figure in the wrestling world, at the last minute with someone who didn't know anything about professional wrestling. So that meant that all throughout the night, he would consistently mess up info about the wrestlers and misname basic wrestling maneuvers, giving the worst color commentary in wrestling history. The biggest controversy at the event was actually its conclusion. It involved Jake the Snake Roberts coming out intoxicated before his match. Roberts was supposed to deliver a promo but instead went into an incoherent rant and stumbled around, culminating in an attempt to make out with his signature snake. The promoter would try and salvage the situation and make it look like Roberts' behavior was planned, but he was too inebriated to understand what was happening and the show was forced to cut the broadcast short. And up next we have Nicole Bass sues WWE for SA. After getting fired from WWE in 1999, Nicole Bass filed a lawsuit for SA against the company for a reported sum of $120 million. The former bodybuilder alleged that the Brooklyn brawler Steve Lombardi assaulted her in an airplane on the way to England by pushing her against a wall, grabbing her chest and grinding his groin onto her body. This claim was dismissed immediately by Lombardi's attorney. And his attorney also said that nobody else on the plane had seen the incident, even though Bass had claimed that the incident took place in full view of fellow passengers on the flight. Bass's lawyer said that a client had been subjected to relentless SA during her five months with the company. The WWE and Vince McMahon said that they only fired her because she wasn't very good at her job and she was let go because of that. Vince McMahon also said that Bass was only attempting to get some sort of revenge on him because he fired her. Around a month after the lawsuit began, it was unanimously thrown out. The jury decided that Bass was not SA during a time working in WWE and awarded her no damages. And up next we have Vince McMahon's victory over God. Vince McMahon proved his lack of respect towards the personal lives and beliefs of his wrestlers when he put Shawn Michaels in an angle where he had to team up with God to face himself and his son Shane at Backlash 2006 in a no disqualifications match. This match happened because the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels, had overcome his personal demons and found new faith in God. After the McMahons came to the ring for this match, God makes his way down as a spotlight, backed by some stereotypical heavenly music. Vince stops him midway and changes the music for a funkier stripper tune, which is absolutely absurd. Vince then orders the referee to search God for foreign objects. The match mostly consists of Vince and Shane beating the crap out of HBK before Vince grabs the microphone and feigns watching God leave his partner to be beaten while saying, ladies and gentlemen, God has left the building. 
After a brief comeback, Michaels is then defeated thanks to some interference from the Spirit Squad, bringing this painful angle to an end. And up next we have Antonio Inoki's embezzlement. In the 1980s, New Japan was wildly popular, but at the beginning of 1984, the Japanese press found out that Antonio Inoki had been stealing money from New Japan Pro Wrestling on a huge scale and using it to cover the losses of his business ventures in Brazil, particularly a sugarcane ethanol and biofuel farm. New Japan booker Hisashi Shinma took the fall and left the company. However, Shinma took a lot of people with him like Satoru Sayama, Maeda, Takada, Fujiwara and the IW refugees like Rasha Kimura and Ryuma Go and other guys like Osamu Kido followed as well. The group would then form a new wrestling promotion called the UWF, the Universal Wrestling Federation. This scandal almost destroyed New Japan Pro Wrestling but luckily they pulled through. And up next we have Chuck and Billy. Chuck Palumbo and Billy Gunn would form a tag team and would slowly start to show signs that they were a couple. They would wear matching red ring gear and bleach their hair, and they also had a personal stylist, fellow wrestler Rico, accompanying them to the ring as their manager slash occasional tag partner. In September of 2002, Chuck proposed to Billy and he accepted. However, because it's wrestling and wrestling weddings never ever go as planned, Eric Bischoff and a bunch of Raw superstars crashed their wedding and ruined it. The failed wedding ceremony and storyline felt like one big publicity stunt, as it felt like WWE didn't book this for genuine reasons, seeing that Chuck Palumbo and Billy Gunn were straight in real life. The Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation were furious at WWE for the storyline, especially after the WWE had acquired the group's help in getting mainstream media attention for their ceremony storyline. And up next we have Hulk Hogan vs Jeff Jarrett at Bash at the Beach 2000. Bash at the Beach 2000 saw Double J Jeff Jarrett defend his WCW championship against Hulk Hogan. For one reason or another, Hulk Hogan and Vince Russo refused to let Jeff Jarrett win, and they were determined to put the world title back on Hogan. All three parties then agreed that Jarrett would literally lay down in the ring and let Hulk Hogan pin him, and that's exactly what they did, much to the shock and anger of the fans. It looked extremely unprofessional, and later in the night, Vince Russo got on the mic and began to quote unquote shoot on Hogan. He claimed that nobody would see Hulk Hogan again in WCW, while also booking a bout between Jeff Jarrett and Booker T later that night for the now vacant WCW World Championship. Hulk Hogan's short match with Jeff Jarrett was Hogan's last match in WCW. Hulk Hogan, who claimed to be unaware of Vince Russo's promo, later sued WCW for defamation of character for the unplanned promo. And up next we have Arn Anderson and Sid Vicious Scissors fight. One of the things that seems to repeat itself in the pro wrestling industry is a veteran feeling that a new up and coming star doesn't have the proper respect for the business. That was certainly the case with Arn Anderson and Sid Vicious. Arn Anderson had been trying to teach the relatively green Vicious the rules of the business, but Sid's stardom had gone to his head. Tensions boiled over during a road trip at a posh hotel. Sid Vicious confronted Arn Anderson in his room and from that point things got murky. Both men accused the other of being the one to start the fight, but one thing is clear. Sid at one point grabbed a pair of scissors and stabbed Arn Anderson five times. Then Arn got the scissors away from Sid and stabbed him anywhere from a dozen to twenty times. Anderson ended up with a punctured lung and both men needed stitches. And just like that, WCW had another scandal on their hands. Since Arn was the longest tenured man in the company, Sid Vicious was fired and ended up in WWE as Sid Justice and Psycho Sid. For years, WCW refused to consider hiring Vicious out of respect for Arn. However, late in the promotion's life, the two buried the hatchet and Arn agreed to allow Sid back into the company. And now we're moving down the iceberg into the second tier, with our first entry on the second tier being the Batista and Melina affair. Batista has gone on record labeling women as his drug of choice during his time on the road with WWE. This penchant for bedroom activity activated a locker room scandal involving him and diva Melina. It was reported in the past that the animal got together with the five-time women's champion while she was still dating WWE star John Morrison. Just to add a bit more fuel to this alleged fire, it was also reported that the former WWE champion was still with his wife Angie, who had been suffering from cancer when the alleged affair took place. Melina would then end up back in a relationship with John Morrison, which reportedly rattled Vince McMahon up the wrong way, as in his eyes, it made John Morrison look weak. And up next we have David Schultz Slaps Reporter. David Schultz was a wrestler who wrestled in many promotions in the 1970s and 80s, including his most well-known stint in the Hart Family Stampede wrestling promotion. He eventually joined WWE, but something happened that will alter his career forever. 
In 1984, ABC ran a story wanting to expose the behind-the-scenes aspect of the professional wrestling business. Another WWE house show in Madison Square Garden in 1984, reporter John Stossel went backstage to get the scoop for his expose piece on professional wrestling. When Stossel started interviewing David Schultz, who wrestled at the event, things got heated. Schultz answered aggressively towards Stossel when defending his love for the professional wrestling industry. Things took a violent turn when Stossel told Schultz that he believed wrestling to be fake, which prompted Schultz to slap Stossel twice in the head. Upon the second slap, Stossel ran off as Schultz continued to yell at him. Because of these events, Schultz got suspended by the New York State Athletic Commission while John Stossel filed a lawsuit against WWE. Even though it got settled out of court, Schultz joined the ranks of wrestlers fired by WWE, despite claiming that WWE management actually told him to hit Stossel. And up next we have Abdullah the Butcher gives a wrestler Hepatitis C. Abdullah the Butcher was known to be one of the most brutal and hardcore in-ring performers of his time, and his career was very long as he worked in the wrestling business for more than 50 years. But for years, he had been accused of infecting many wrestlers with Hepatitis C. This came to prominence when Canadian wrestler Hannibal filed a lawsuit against the violent superstar. Hannibal got infected during his match with Abdullah the Butcher in 2007. The Butcher used the same blade to cut them both open during their match in Alberta. Hannibal claimed in a YouTube video that Abdullah the Butcher had kept his Hepatitis C a secret. Hannibal claims that WWE extended an offer to him in 2009 but withdrew it when he tested positive for Hepatitis C. Hannibal then sued Abdullah the Butcher because of missed revenues. It is exceedingly unlikely that Hannibal acquired the disease from somewhere else because he was able to provide court documents demonstrating that he and Abdullah the Butcher had the same rare strain of the illness. In his defense, the Butcher claimed that Hannibal was the one who gave it to him when he bladed him. In the end, Hannibal won his lawsuit against Abdullah the Butcher and Abdullah was ordered to pay $2.1 million to Hannibal. However, the Butcher did not have that sort of money because if he did, then he wouldn't still be wrestling on the independent circuit well into his 70s. And up next we have Shawn Michaels beat up by six marines. Many times in the 90s, Shawn Michaels would get into a lot of trouble, but he was always surrounded by the clique, which included the likes of Triple H, Kevin Nash, and Razor Ramon. And they would act as a barrier for Michaels, keeping him grounded and out of trouble to the best of their ability. However, in the autumn of 1995, the rest of the clique would be off on a European tour, whilst Michaels was working the US house show circuit. Before a show, Michaels would go to a club with a few other wrestlers, and not settled with heavy drinking and partying, Michaels then decided that he wanted to find a girl to hook up with that night. He targeted a girl on the dance floor and went to talk to her, but he was quickly confronted by her boyfriend who was a soldier in the US Marines. Despite being warned by the Marine to not talk to his girl, Michaels proceeded to do this anyway and they got into a scuffle. The bouncer stepped in and told the pair to get out of the club, but outside of the club, the Marine's five other Marine friends were waiting for Michaels. These six marines beat the living crap out of Shawn Michaels and left him with a torn eyelid, black eyes and other minor injuries. On TV, the events were glorified in Michaels' favor to explain his broken face, but after a threat of a lawsuit from the soldier in question, this was dropped quickly. However, following his relinquishment of the Intercontinental Championship due to not being able to compete, all these events would lead to a babyface turn for Michaels, with him gaining sympathy from fans, leading him to win the Royal Rumble the following year and winning the WWE Championship at WrestleMania. And up next we have Sable sues the WWE. Sable was well known for her time in WWE during the Attitude Era, but in 1999 she was released from WWE. Her release prompted her to file a $140 million lawsuit against WWE. She claimed that men would routinely walk into the women's dressing room as if by accident and they would cut holes into the walls to watch the women dressing. And she also claimed that WWE produced catalogs and t-shirts depicting her in a degrading fashion offering sexual favors. She also claimed that she was requested to display affection to women to promote a lesbian angle. She also said that she was asked to have a gown ripped off repeatedly and was also asked to expose her breasts by mistake on national television during a wrestling contest. Sable claimed many other things but above all, she wanted $140 million from WWE. The lawsuit was reportedly settled a couple of months later for a lot less than the proposed $140 million but she still got a significant chunk of money in the 7 figure range. And up next we have the Jim Duggan and Iron Sheik arrest. Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheik may have played bitter rivals on TV, but behind the scenes they were actually great friends who would travel together. They were intent on keeping their travels under wraps because a lot of the times they were facing each other at these events and they couldn't be seen together in each other's company. However, they were only able to keep it a secret for so long and when they were finally caught, the entire wrestling business was blown open for good. 
In May of 1987, Jim Duggan was driving himself and the Iron Sheik to an event in New Jersey when a state trooper caught Duggan drinking a beer while he was driving. He got pulled over and Duggan was open and honest to the officer. He told him that he had a small amount of weed in the car which prompted the cop to search the vehicle and their bags. Unbeknownst to Duggan, the Iron Sheik had coke in his bags. They were both arrested with Duggan getting let go quickly but the Iron Sheik getting charged with a felony. The Iron Sheik was let go on bail but the damage was already done as the story hit the airwaves. Back in 1987, kayfabe was alive and well and these were the days that heels needed to leave arenas early to avoid mobs, receive death threats and needed protection. So it came as a huge shock when not just a face and a heel were traveling together but they were also doing heavy drugs. WWE had to do something quick and so the two were suspended and then fired. But it didn't really matter because the secret was blown open to resting fans. And up next we have the DBRC family embezzlement. The DBRC family is a notable wrestling family with a rich history in the wrestling industry. The patriarch of the family is the million dollar man, Ted DBRC Sr, who had a highly successful career in the 1970s and 80s. Ted DBRC Sr's sons, Ted DBRC Jr and Brett DBRC both pursued careers in professional wrestling with Ted DBRC Jr having a successful stint in WWE. However, the family have been involved in some very, very shady dealings. In 2022, the Mississippi Department of Human Services sued Ted DiBiase Sr., Ted DiBiase Jr., and Brett DiBiase, and several other people to recover more than $20 million in money squandered from the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Anti-Poverty Program. So basically, the DiBiase family was stealing money that was supposed to go to poor families in the Mississippi area. Between 2017 and 2019, Ted DiBiase's companies received more than $3 million from this anti-poverty fund and Ted DiBiase Sr. and Brett DiBiase also received significant amounts of money from this fund. Sr. Jr. and Brett are all facing different charges because they were involved in the scheme to varying degrees but the most significant charges are lobbied towards Jr. who is facing one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, six counts of wire fraud, two counts of theft concerning programs receiving federal funds and four counts of money laundering. This case is ongoing and is very complicated but in the worst case scenario, if they give Ted DiBiase Jr. the maximum sentencing for all of his offenses, he could be sentenced to over 100 years in prison. So he's in big, big trouble. And up next we have Seth Rollins private photos leak. In early 2015, Seth Rollins was on fire but a wild series of events eventually unfolded that put question marks around Seth Rollins. His social media was purportedly hacked, resulting in his account posting a revealing photo of NXT prospect Zara Schreiber, whom he was seeing at the time. Unfortunately for Rollins, his relationship with Schreiber had been a secret because he was also engaged to a woman named Layla Schultz. His fiancée retaliated by posting nude photos of Rollins himself. This all happened in a whirlwind while the architect held the money in the bank briefcase and introduced discourse about whether WWE might pull the plug on his main event push if not cut ties with him altogether. Fortunately, things cooled off after the initial storm and Rollins and Schreiber broke up. Seth Rollins is now happily married to Becky Lynch. And up next we have the Hiroshi Tanahashi stabbing. In November of 2002, up and coming star of New Japan Pro Wrestling, Hiroshi Tanahashi faced a real life crisis. Tanahashi was at the apartment of his girlfriend, Hitomi Hara, who was a news reporter and production assistant at TV Asahai, the TV home to New Japan Pro Wrestling. The couple got into a heated argument where it was reported that Tanahashi broke up with Hara. Feeling jilted, Hitomi Hara threatened to kill Tanahashi and then herself. As Tanahashi turned his back to leave, Hara took a kitchen knife and stabbed Tanahashi in the back twice. Tanahashi was able to fight off his girlfriend and escape. He was rushed to the hospital where he stayed for 10 days. Tanahashi suffered a collapsed lung as a result of the stabbing which prevented him from taking part in 2003's January 4 Tokyo Dome show which would later be rebranded as Wrestle Kingdom in 2007. Hara was sentenced to 3 years in prison but ended up serving 4 years probation. The judge in Hara's case opted for probation because he said that she committed the crime only after becoming emotional. And up next we have the murder of Dino Bravo. Dino Bravo started his wrestling career in Montreal, Canada in the 1970s and he became one of the top professional wrestling stars of Canada, winning several major Canadian titles. He eventually signed to the WWE and he became the sole holder of the WWE Canadian Championship before the title was abandoned in 1986. He retired in the early 90s and he started winding down his career. He began training wrestlers in Montreal, Canada. Rumors then emerged that he was involved in the illegal business of cigarette smuggling. After the mafia took notice, 
Bravo was shot dead in his home in 1993 at the age of 44. He was hit with 11 bullets in the head and torso. In an interview, his former opponent, Bret the Hitman Hart, revealed that Bruno confided to him shortly before his death, saying that he knew that his days were numbered. Bravo's murder is still unsolved to this day. And now we're moving on to the deepest and darkest part of the iceberg, Tier 1, with our first entry on Tier 1 being the Ring Boy Scandal. The WWE Ring Boy scandal refers to a controversy that unfolded in the early 1990s involving allegations of SA and exploitation of underage boys who worked as ring crew members for the WWE. The scandal first came to light in 1992 when Tom Cole, a former ring boy, filed a lawsuit against Pat Patterson, Terry Garvin and Mal Phillips, who were all prominent figures in WWE at the time. Cole alleged that he and other boys had been SA'd by these three men. As the legal battle unfolded, more ring boys came forward with similar allegations. After all of these allegations came to light, Pat Patterson, Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin were fired from WWE and the case was settled out of court with Tom Cole. Pat Patterson was the only one of the predators to get rehired by WWE. And up next we have DX in blackface. One of the most infamous moments in the history of WWE and DX was the segment where DX marked the nation of domination by wearing blackface in a moment that WWE would like everyone to forget. This segment saw Triple H in blackface as The Rock, Sean Waltman as Mark Henry, Road Dogg as Dino Brown, and Billy Gunn as The Godfather. The rivalry with the nation of domination was honestly one of the best rivalries DX ever had, and unfortunately, this controversial moment will always cast a shadow over both legendary stables. WWE has removed the segment from all of its platforms, but there's no hiding that this moment took place. And up next we have the Jerry Lawler allegations. Jerry Lawler, in addition to being a legendary Memphis wrestler, was one half of the greatest announcing duo in the history of the business. Jim Ross doing play-by-play -play, plus Jerry Lawler doing comedic heel commentary was absolute gold. But in 1993, he faced a scandal that could have destroyed his career. Lola was charged with the grape of a 13-year-old girl, and although these charges were eventually dropped, Lola did plead guilty to harassing a witness in the case, who was a 14-year-old girl who was going to testify against him. Initially, WWE suspended Lola, but then they led him back into the fold after the worst charges were dropped. And up next we have the Lucha Libre brick attack. On November 19, 2018, in a match against Al Cuervo for the Lucha Libre boom, Angel O Demonio threw a brick against his opponent's head. This was no WWE style cinder block that disintegrated upon impact. It was a literal cinder block. In what was almost an astonishing and grotesque irony, the incident unfolded in a casket match. The gimmick of course was very nearly all too real. Al Cuevo was lucky to escape alive. Demonio was interviewed after the fact, and after first blaming the incident on his bad aim, he somehow contrived to suggest that Cuevo deserved it. Demonio was indefinitely suspended by the Mexico City Boxing and Wrestling Commission, but he resurfaced on the scene a month later. And because pro wrestling is just carny by nature, when Demonio returned to wrestling, promoters used pictures of the incident to promote their show. All of this was in tremendously poor taste. Demonio then died in 2021 from COVID-19. And up next we have Rob Feinstein. Rob Feinstein was the owner of RF Video, which was a video distribution company to ECW. Feinstein was looking to find a wrestling promotion that will allow RF Video to continue selling DVDs and VHS tapes about pro wrestling after the original ECW was bought out by WWE in 2001. Feinstein as a result created his own wrestling promotion that would allow him to sell more DVDs and the company Feinstein made was Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor is an important part of wrestling history as it was home to many wrestlers who have become legends. Ring of Honor would go on to form a wrestling alliance with TNA and they would band together to produce some of the best wrestling product outside the WWE. However, in early 2004, it was revealed through an internet-based sting operation that Feinstein was a predator. He was looking to obtain lewd favors from someone off the internet who he believed was a 14-year-old boy. In reality, it was an adult posing as a minor. When these shocking turn of events were revealed and publicized by various news sources, this caused a large scandal for Ring of Honor as the founder of the company was revealed to be a nonce. When the news broke, TNA ended their relationship with ROH out of the fear that this negativity could affect their reputation. In the end, Feinstein resigned as the CEO of Ring of Honor in March of 2004. And up next we have Chris Benoit steals Kevin Sullivan's wife. Chris Benoit's sad, miserably tragic end often overshadows much of his career. One thing that is often overlooked is how he essentially stole another man's wife in WCW. 
At the time, Kevin Sullivan was an active wrestler, but his main job was working backstage as one of the head bookers. When Kevin Sullivan was given the task of getting over the insanely talented Chris Benoit, he essentially booked his own divorce. Kevin Sullivan's wife Nancy had been a fixture in WCW for years, acting as a manager slash valet known as Woman. Sullivan booked an angle where Chris Benoit would lure away his wife Nancy. Since these were the days of kayfabe, he insisted that Nancy and Benoit travel together, eat together, and try to put out the illusion that they were a legitimate couple. However, love takes strange turns and the storyline became real life. Nancy Sullivan divorced Kevin Sullivan and married Chris Benoit for real. Kevin Sullivan responded by burying Chris Benoit on the card, often having him put over younger talent in squash matches. WCW officials didn't lift a finger to help Benoit as they thought that he had it coming for breaking up Kevin Sullivan's marriage. On the other hand, most of the locker room blamed Sullivan for putting his wife into that spot in the first place. The horrific events of Chris Benoit's last weekend on planet Earth where he took the lives of his wife Nancy, his son Daniel and himself will haunt him forever. There was clearly some animosity between Chris and Kevin Sullivan though and a lot of wrestling fans have come up with the conspiracy that Kevin Sullivan was the one who was actually behind these murders. And up next we have Katie Vick. In 2002, Kane was feuding with Triple H. In their feud, Triple H brought up Katie Vick. According to Kane, Katie Vick was a close friend who supported him fervently at the outset of his wrestling career. Their friendship grew over time and they spent a lot of time together. One fateful evening, after Katie had a lot to drink at a party, the 7 foot Kane decided to drop her home. However, a kayfabe fatal car accident occurred midway in which Vic died, but Kane only suffered minor injuries. And in an outrageous twist, Triple H then claimed that the autopsy found traces of the big red machine's semen. This was the beginning of a horrendous tale. As the rivalry progressed, we saw inexplicable television scenes of Kane making love to a dead Katie Vic at a funeral home. This was just a mannequin. This storyline should have never made it to television and over two decades later, fans still express outrage and disgust over the storyline. And up next we have Kensuke Sasaki kills a trainee. Former WCW United States Champion and Japanese wrestling great, Kensuke Sasaki has had a long and memorable career. As good as his career has been though, it is somewhat overshadowed by a murky incident that occurred at the New Japan Dojo in 1995. During a training session at the dojo, student Hiromitsu Gompai died while under the watch of Sasaki. According to the book Ring the Bell, Gompai was not performing his grueling tasks up to standard and was beaten and repeatedly suplexed by Sasaki because of it, leading to severe head trauma and ultimately his death. New Japan wrestlers Scott Norton and Bam Bam Bigelow alluded to Sasaki's involvement with Gompai's death during shoot interviews. Sasaki was never formally charged over the death of Gompai, but there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding the incident. And up next we have The Undertaker vs The Big Boss Man at WrestleMania 15. At WrestleMania 15, The Undertaker took on the Big Boss Man, but there was a shocking and disturbing post-match segment that overshadowed the match. After The Undertaker emerged victorious, in a visually graphic and unsettling scene, The Undertaker proceeded to hang the Big Boss Man with a noose from the Hell in the Cell structure. This unexpected and horrifying act was intended to evoke a strong emotional response from the audience, but it crossed the line of acceptability and received significant backlash. This whole segment was tasteless and offensive, going beyond the boundaries of what is considered appropriate for a professional wrestling event, considering that there was young kids in the crowd. And up next we have the murder of La Paquita and Expectrito 2. Alberto and Alejandro Jimenez were twin brothers who were dwarfs, and they were established athletes in AAA in Mexico, and there they competed under the ring names of La Paquita and Expectrito 2. Despite being little people and having very short height, they managed to make it to the WWE and had a pretty successful wrestling career, but it was all cut short in 2009 when the twin brothers were found dead in their hotel room. It was reported that the two dwarf brothers checked into a hotel after a Sunday night wrestling show. Allegedly, two female fornication sellers approached the wrestlers and were invited back to their hotel room. In the hotel room, the two women spiked the men's alcohol with what was believed to be eye drops. The brothers drank this toxic concoction and the two women proceeded to rob them of their wallets and cell phones. The twins sadly died from the drugs added to their alcohol. Usually what these two fornication sellers did did not kill the victims, but the size of La Paquita and Expectrito 2 played a significant part in their death. The two women were eventually arrested and were sentenced to 47 years in prison for the murder of the dwarf twins. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos and also please like, share, comment and subscribe. But anyway, goodbye.